Welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario, um, our usual group. Uh, tonight we'll be discussing humanism, the Anthropocene, and enemies of the system approach. Um, and uh, I'll be doing some slides in the beginning and uh, David Hawk, who's then joining us from Iowa, he'll, I'll let him take all the tough questions. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll just go through the self-introductions. Uh, I'll review some of the, uh, the pre-readings. Um, I have to say that it, uh, the, uh, the, the content um, has been long in brewing and uh, we've had a, a side reading group uh, where we've been discussing some of the stuff. So uh, hopefully it, uh, we'll get through it a little smoother um, and then we'll have some commentary and discussion, David Hawk. Uh, first, we'll go around as we usually do. Uh, everyone, um, if you could introduce yourselves, I guess I should moderate that. Um, and I'll stop the share. And um, let's see, what should the question of the day be? It's like um, maybe um, since we're talking about humanism and the Anthropocene um, and uh, uh, enemies of the systems approach, have you heard of any of these and do you identify with any of them? So um, hmm. let's see, Doug, say hi. <laughs> uh, thanks, it's interesting. I just saw a blue heron uh, out my window. Wow. Um, so yes, I, I, I do identify, and I'll get that in a second. Uh, Doug Ostrom, I'm based in Indianapolis. I am from the South, Southern Ontario. Um, but, you know, I've been here now, so actually more than half my life. Um, still doing a little bit of consulting, a little bit of teaching, and I'm, I'm sort of looking at both the, the pluses and, and the limits of, of humanism in terms of how we organize collective activity. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Kelly, say hi. Oh, dear. Uh, hi, I'm Kelly Okamura. I'm in downtown Toronto. Um, I wandered into systems through design, design thinking. Um, enemies of systems. I'm still wondering whether I'm an anarchist, thanks to David <laughs> Hawk. <laughs> thanks, Kelly. Hi, Don. Say Don. Say hi. 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 Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how to top that. Um, I've been interested in systems for a long, long time uh, because I was introduced to it by people who are interested in the conserver society, which seems to be uh, coming back to haunt us today. Uh, so I'd like to hear what there is to, what there is to say about this. Yeah. Thanks, Don. Okay. And Nelia. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Nelia. Uh, I'm a former student of uh, David. I did the the program at OCAD in uh, uh, strategic foresight, and we did a systems thinking class together. Um, right now, I'm working at the CRA. Um, uh, my background is in law. I'm uh, trained as a lawyer, um, so <laughs> lots of systems. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I've always. But you know, it's funny uh, you mentioned anarchism, anarchism, because I I have a bit of an anarchist streak in me, and I know that's so strange as a, a lawyer who works at the CRA. <laughs> but I think it's also just because I I don't like people telling me what to do. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and with that, I'll pass. Thanks, Nelia. M Troop, who I happen to know is Michael. Uh, yeah, Michael. Well, I'll change the, the name here. Um, so, I'm also a SFI alum um, in uh, Nelia's cohort, um, engineer by training. So, I'm interested in systems, I guess, from that angle. Um, yeah, that's. Much as I can say. Thanks. Uh, Roxin, Roxini? Uh, Roxy, that's a combination of my first name and ah, last sorry. name. <laughs> but Roxini, Roxy, anyone, I could go by that. <laughs> sounds like a drink. I was, I was going to say, it sounds kind of like a kind of noodle. Also I, like do. <laughs> um, I am also an SFI alumnus. And uh, I work as a service designer, and I'm always interested in the way that many things are connected. Um, I was fascinated by 
all of the big words in this in the title of this event i was like what is that and how are they connected mm -hmm. so really looking forward to it thanks zad yeah hi everyone my name is zad uh, i'm also a sfi graduate from the program um, and i've been collaborating with uh david uh, ing as well um, so I have some exposure um, to a little bit of the critical uh, perspective. And I think the I've been following some of the readings, David, on the humanisms, things that you've been posting. I know we have separate meetings where I ask you Q&As, but there's a lot of alignment between the critique of human hubris and arrogance, to be blunt, uh, through the lens of humanism. It was interesting to me, or that's what I extracted from the readings. So I look forward to maybe asking some questions around that through through the session. Thanks. Thanks. Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm also SFI uh, grad and um, also like Roxy, just intrigued by the words in the title. <laughs> so that mm -hmm. um, that felt really interesting. Anthropocene is a fairly new concept to me, um, really mostly introduced through my work with uh, the S Systemic Design Association. I'm uh, the board secretary. And um, lots of people know me as the person who basically is the go-to for relating systems thinking and design and also post, yeah. So um, yeah, just taking taking aerial meetings. So tonight's the night. Hmm. Thanks. Stephen Brigose, who I think got a haircut. <laughs> well, David, you are absolutely amazing. First of all, your memory is fantastic. <laughs> anyway, I'm a, I'm a retired university professor, uh, Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, uh, and uh, I worked uh, I worked as a systems analyst in industry for about ten years. Uh, scarred me uh, scarred me for life. Uh, my system's interests kind of go back to Kenneth Boulding and Anatole Rappaport. And, 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 and I have to admit that uh, as far as they are concerned, uh, they're, as, uh, they're as relevant today as they ever were. And um, originally I was inspired by general semantics. I'm, I'm sorry mm -hmm. that the work has not continued. And also mm -hmm. general systems theory in the spirit of, of Von, uh, von Bertalanffy, uh, lectured at Trent University in Computer Studies for about 30 years mm -hmm. and uh, followed, uh, followed the career of Sherry Turkle. Uh, Sherry Turkle started with a book on Second Self, yeah. uh, Computers as Evocative Objects. Uh, and uh, that kind of worldview has shaped my thinking over the years. Thank you, David. Great. Thanks. Griff. Hey everybody, good evening. I'm Griffin, it's nice to meet you. I'm a PhD student in sustainability management at the University of Waterloo, which has a pretty strong systems bend, systems and design bend, Waterloo Institute for Complexity and Innovation, uh, social innovation and resilience. These are like big features of that program. Been floating around this circle, Systems Thinking Ontario for a couple of years. Uh, big background in startups, products, systems, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm also the country leader of Creative Commons Canada. So I coordinate the Creative Commons in Canada, coast to coast. Mm. That's about it for me. Thanks, David. Thanks. Mm. Uh, Dan, say hi. Hi, everyone. Yes, I am also intrigued by the alphabet soup that we've been presented today with. And actually, what uh, I've uh, I come from systems. Uh, system changes learning from David's uh, learning circle. And one of the things I, when I, I was reading about the humanism stuff that kind of threw me and still throws me is this separation of humans from religion. And, you know, that whole thing is very fascinating for me because I wondered if that means that there's a gap in spirituality too. So I'll be very intrigued by that uh, discussion as we go through that. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Uh, David Hawk, would you like to explain Iowa? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all around me. It's, uh, it's a mile and a half to my closest neighbor, and there are nine pig factories a mile and a half away, almost all the way around me. And so I'm sort of the last holdout, at not putting in a pig factory. 
I, I get the smell, so I get to, you know, communicate with my neighbors and be friends with them. But uh, except for the smell, we don't talk much. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I have this facility uh, in the middle of the farm, which David's been nice enough to visit a couple of times, plus more, I think. And uh, it's a facility that I mostly built myself uh, in part because I trained to be an architect and I don't like architects. They're too arrogant. Uh, uh, well, I won't compare them to lawyers just yet. Let's hold off on that. But, <laughs> but I'm sort of tired of, uh, of architects. So I enjoy building and not designing. So in this particular house, I got some neighbors to work with me and I would come back from back east where I was living and work with them and explain to them that uh, in the building of this house, there would be no design, no plans, no timetable, no budget, and no idea of what each of the spaces would be like when you lived in it. So please just help me build this as you think it makes sense. And lo and behold, throughout a year and a half of us working on it, everything that was a mistake along the way turned out to be the best parts of the house. And so none of the good parts came from non-mistakes. Anyway, when it was done, uh, the house cost 60% as much as a normal house in the area. And they were quite amazed at how that could happen. So anyway, the people that helped me said, I've ruined their life forever. <laughs> they can never go back to paying attention to architects, designers, <laughs> economists, or people that keep track of time. They can't live that way anymore. And mm -hmm. they did quite a marvelous job. So this is just another example. But uh, uh, maybe going back one more step, David, uh, I sadly was in the uh, Vietnam episode way back when in the 60s. Mm. And I have the proud distinction of being charged under an Article 14 uh, during battle conditions. So they actually held a trial during battle conditions because I had been disobedient and I had not paid attention to an officer. And I use the expression, which since, since then became somewhat famous. And this is the one that allowed me to win in the trial. The expression was, we the unwilling led by the unqualified to kill the unfortunate, die for the ungrateful. And somehow everyone except the captain that was charging me liked that expression and said it, per it fit perfectly. Uh, based on that, I was promoted two ranks. The captain was demoted one rank. If you're interested, the uh, order was for me to shoot at women and children because they were part of the army also. And Putin would have enjoyed them greatly. They, they would have fit right in. Anyway, the systems approach as I got into it uh, was something I never really had to preach about or argue for because I sort of thought that was life. And that I couldn't imagine non-systemic thinking and still being alive. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until I entered this program of social system sciences of Russ Akoff, that I learned there was another viewpoint. <laughs> I didn't know analysis was so damned important. So in the system science degree program, I learned a lot about those that were not systems thinkers. And that was quite revealing. I, I didn't realize the world was so pathetic, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, and then in, as part of that program, uh, had tremendous fights with Russell Akoff and a few others. Such things as he always used categories of four. I always showed him that it was always three plus one, that all of his categories were more meaningful as three plus one. And he was endlessly irritated with that idea, but I think it's still <laughs> true. Uh, in the seventies, I started on a project in 75, that uh, two-year research project that ended with two years later with a document describing climate change if humans didn't find a way to deal with uh, their derogatory notion about nature. 
and their deterioration of nature. Mm. And so in 79, I completed two years of work in it in climate change. And that was a scandal in 77. Uh, even my PhD review committee asked me to please remove that, that do not use terms like that in a dissertation. And anyway, then I knew the systems approach was golden. I uh, <laughs> felt quite good about it. And the Dean of the Wharton School, who was our mentor, supervisor, he claimed I would never get my PhD if I left climate change in the document. He said he would do everything possible to keep me from passing. <laughs> and I learned later what his real argument was, was my chapter on anarchism, that he did not want a Wharton PhD with anarchism as chapter six. Mm. <laughs> And it really, really pissed him off. But nonetheless, it did make it through. And he didn't make it. I think he's now deceased. Oh, so entropy did get him. So <laughs> nonetheless, the systems approach is quite crucial for me. Uh, so crucial, I tend not to talk about it. Because it's, it's so obvious. Why would you not see it? So anyway, if you're going to explain to me why you don't see it, I'd love that tonight. Okay, thanks, David. Um, so I'm going to start slides. I'm going to share uh, my screen again and run through the slides a little bit with you. Um, and I'm probably going to need uh, uh, Dan to yell at me if uh, people can leave notes in the chat or questions as we go along, because uh, I can't always see them. Um, anyway, so uh, there were a number of pre-readings, and um, it's interesting trying to go through them and figure out uh, how to explain some of this stuff. So given that there was humanism in the title, I said, okay, well, first thing is we should probably have at least a definition so we don't have to argue about it. So humanism, as we just see it, as we discuss it today, is both generally any philosophy, so we're in philosophy, we're outside of science, mm -hmm. concerned emphasize human welfare and dignity, and either optimistic about the powers of human reason, or at least insistent that we have no alternative but to use it as best we can. And so this is interesting definition because I'm not sure if people, when you, you know, people will say, oh yeah, well, I'm a humanist. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I get the human welfare and dignity part, but mm -hmm. the human reason is something that we hadn't really discussed or thought about. And so, oh, that's interesting. Um, so the Anthropocene um, defines the Earth's most recent geologic time period. So it's actually uh, material as being human influence. And it's based on the overwhelming evidence that atmospheric ge geologic, hydrologic, biospheric, and other earth system processes now altered by humans. Okay, so if we're humanists and the Anthropocene is something that's new, uh, humanism goes back all the way pretty well to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, but the Anthropocene is something that's actually 21st century. So if this is the case where all of a sudden we've discovered that we actually have an impact on the earth, uh, what does that mean? Yeah. Now, if we go back to 2003, this is actually a publication by uh, Gilberto Gallopin, um, a systems approach to sustainable and sustainable development. And he said that there are, are three alternative views that we could look at. So the first one on the left, the extreme anthropocentric position where you look sustainability of the human system and he talked about economics and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Essentially, this is what we call weak sustainability. Um, that you know, the earth is here for human beings. There's another in the middle situation, the extreme biocentric position, which is, oh, I think I copied this wrong. It would not be the sustainability of the human system only. It would be the sustainability of nature only. Um, those who would value ecological sustainability above everything. Um, and humans go underneath that, we call it very strong sustainability. And he had the idea in 2003 of a socio-ecological system. Actually, I think the people in the Resilience Center now call it social ecological systems, SES, mm -hmm. which is sustainability of the whole system. And it's, combined, it's a combination of societal, which is a human component, the subsystems with an ecological or biophysical component. So we have the idea of strong sustainability. So when we talk about sustainability, it's kind of like, well, what do you mean by sustainability? And uh, I don't want to get into flourishing because that's a newer term, but let's just stick with the older terms of sustainability and sustainable development that we could actually have associated with that. 
Now, Ehrenfeld, and now, now, now this is where the confusion, now this is David Ehrenfeld, who is actually a biologist. Uh, don't confuse him with John Ehrenfeld, who actually created the term flourishing and has been using that. Um, but when he talks in, the, in writing the book, The Arrogance of Humanism, he says, when one chooses a guiding philosophy of life, and the modern world has chosen humanism, one becomes responsible for all the consequences that flow from that choice. We have chosen to transform our original faith in a higher authority to faith in the power of reason and human capabilities. It has proven a misplaced trust. This is the other side of humanism, as I point out in the first chapter, and no amount of denial make it go away. This preface is actually from the 1981 version of the book. Um, he, the original book was done in 1978. So he's responding in the preface to people who have crit criticized him and was trying to clarify it. But it's interesting that, he, again, he brings in that idea of the power, reason, and human capabilities, which goes back to um, the Enlightenment. Hmm. So what does this mean? So false assumptions, chapter one, uh, the principal human assumption, humanist assumptions. So it's very simply, the first one is all problems are soluble. And in particular, all problems are soluble by people. Hmm. Uh, and so, OK, so human beings are now responsible and they think okay if it's a problem we can deal with it uh secondary assumptions under that many problems are soluble by technology and we talk about that uh quite often in, in uh, akoff has the idea of uh pre-activists who believe the future is always better than today um but we have the idea that problems are soluble by technology um those problems are not soluble by technology or technology alone have solutions to the social world Okay, so we can't deal with the technology, then we can deal with it in politics or economics. Uh, when the chips are down, we can apply ourselves and work together for a solution before it's too late. Okay, uh, we can ask David a little bit more about uh, people selling their souls and go to and getting, uh, trying to get their souls back a little bit later. <laughs> Some resources are infinite, all finite or limited resources have substitutes. That's an economic assumption you typically have, and human civilization will survive. And so it says that these assumptions cut across political lines. And so people have criticized him of, of humanists of being leftist or rightist. It doesn't really matter. He says this applies all, all, in all cases. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna to jump to chapter four um, where he brings in the idea of emotions. And he actually talks about, it's interesting that he's a biologist. You have to realize the biologist. He says it's extremely difficult to trap or poison wild Norway rats. Right. And the rats uh, always, always have this innate distrust of anything new in their environment. Um, when this happens with human beings, it's called superstition or emotion. Okay, so when we're human beings, we assume that we should be rational. So, you know, we come out of a hole and we look around and, you know, that looks like a nice treat and we might deal with that. But it's like, well, you know, should we, do, <laughs> should we rationally look at that? Because the, and the, and the, the, um, uh, the uh, rat would actually be really suspicious and would take it very carefully. A human being go rationally to risk, maybe we should go ahead with it. So um, the way that Ehrenfeld deals with this, he says this inborn protection, and he says it's, as he described it, it's too complex to merit a simple name, but he's going to call it emotions. Um, he doesn't like the word notions, but um, the way he looks at it is it does not indicate the services provided to the organism by the complex of reactions that it represents. And so human beings are not machines. And so there's something else going on. So how should we be considering and looking at that? Uh, if I go to the right column, um, he suggests emotion is an integration and summar summarization phenomenon. And he talks about the census. You know, if you took a census and they have the Census Bureau or statistics bureaus, um, do they actually give us all the information we need? And he says, there are realms beyond the realm of reason and their proper designation is irrational which means not rational rather than irrational and mm -hmm. irrational would be anti-rational. So it's against it, but there's, there's a, uh, a middle case here for the irrational, which is something that uh, would make sense uh, for the rat as an example. So, you know, why does a rat have an innate trust of anything new? Mm -hmm. Well, is that irrational or is it just irrational because we can't actually map it out and figure out form formulaically what that is all about. So this brings us to Churchman, the systems approach and its enemies, 1979. Um, I, I, for, for those who are looking on web searches, uh, I've 
I've put this, I, I put a summary on my blog of, uh, of Churchman's book and also of uh, Ehrenfeld I put on a different um, blog uh, because it's sometimes hard to get these things in soft copy. Um, the Systems Approach and its Enemy is actually a different book from the Systems Approach that came earlier. So this book is just another step in the search for a meaning of generality, in this case, a general design of social systems. So uh, Wes Churchman is one of the senior people in the systems movement. Uh, he was Russ Acoff's PhD supervisor. There wasn't a very big age gap between them, but um, he, he was a supervisor at the time at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he says there's an immense part of social systems reality that doesn't fit in any of the popular dichotomies. So rational, irrational, objective, subjective, so on and so on. And so, you know, if, is there something outside what we can, when we're looking at systems that we should be considering? And what he says is, in this text, I've used the word enemy to connote this immense land of social systems that have remained largely unexplored by quote unquote, hard systems analysts who thereby reveal a distinct softness of living by avoiding the dangers of unexplored map, unmapped territories. Um, I often make jokes that uh, um, when I was taking a st statistics course, um, there's this, this joke about uh, coming out into the dark and seeing uh, a lamppost by the parking lot and there's a drunkard under the lamppost. <laughs> and we ask why, you know, what are you doing there? And he says, oh, I lost my keys. And go, did you lose your keys under the lamppost? He says, no, I lost them over there in the forest. Why are you looking here? It's because the light is better over here. Mm -hmm. And so this is the problem we have with hard systems analysis. You actually need data to actually make the analysis work to understand <laughs> what's going on. If you go beyond that, uh, then, and, and we have to do that, particularly if we're looking into uh, what the future might be because there's no data on the future, it's hard to do systems analysis on the future. Mm -hmm. On systems and their design, this is chapter one of Churchman. So he talks about the environmental fallacy and that's uh, a simpler, it would be fallacy of ignoring the environment, which means you, re you reduce the system down to a level you can actually analyze it. But in a broader perspective, what he says is no problem can be solved simply on its own basis. Every problem has an environment to which it is inextricably united. And we've been having this discussion actually within the system changes learning circle, where we've actually managed to expunge the use of the word environment, because what happens is the way we look at the world is actually that um, if you imagine that you're in time and you're a line or a lifeline, you join a texture, a, a texture, which is a weave of others, of other threads. And so uh, environment doesn't really help you understand that because environment would in effect be you're in this fabric or this weave, this contexture and everything is, and, and the environment would be everything except for you, which is like, okay, I'm not sure that's really helpful. So, um, so environmental doesn't really capture the way that we might think about systems because there's environment is something that we define as a system boundary. Mm -hmm. The system approach, uh, our hero espouses something called system approach, which is designed to avoid the environmental fallacy. Um, and the systems approach is for managing and planning our human affairs with the intent that we as a living species conduct ourselves properly in the world. Okay, so he's kind of defined the systems approach here. Now, what he said, and this is interesting, I was listening to a talk about the virtues of world models where the Club of Rome had sponsored. The speaker was asking why the world's leaders had not more rapidly responded to the model's result. The answer came like a flash because they are not in the systems approach, but rather live and decide outside it. And so the question that you would ask with a systems approach is, are you inside the system on which decisions are being made or are you outside criticizing it? Four enemies that he proposes then, firstly, politics, which is the way that people gather around issues like human living, food, shelter, education, so on. Morality, the underlying spirit of all actions to drive a person to act as he does. Religion, not necessarily organized religion, but something higher, more powerful, more knowing, more comprehensive. Um, in the discussion that we had um, in February with Gary Metcalf, and we're talking about um, uh, um, alcoholics, uh, one of the principles there is uh, you don't have, if you are an alcoholic, um, you don't have to believe in God, but if uh, if you if alcohol has power over you, it is your God, it becomes your religion. 
Um, aesthetics is the core of all action that makes act, action radiant for us. It could be beautiful, ugly, pleasurable, whatever. So, so these are the ways in which the systems approach would be attacked. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Hawk, who's going to try to explain some of that. You want to try to uh, do that, David? Uh, no, no, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, going back to where you started in the uh, arrogance of humanism, Ehrenfeld, et cetera, uh, may be worth noting that uh, one of his fans who quite liked that book is this funny physicist you may have heard of, um, Stephen Hawking, yeah. that he quite liked Aaron Feld's book, one of the few people that really liked it. It was not widely popular. And then Hawking came up with this comment that I've used <laughs> repeatedly, a few others have used it, but, but uh, I found no one except me that likes it. But nonetheless, uh, his comment is it's, somewhat long, but the gist is that humans are a chemical slime on the earth. And then he elaborates on <laughs> why they're really not very significant. And they're mm -hmm. more significant in a problematic sense than in terms of power and insight and intelligence and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so Hawking elaborated on the uh, arrogance of humanism pretty harshly in his comments about uh, Humanism, as most people accept it, use it, think of it, mm -hmm. he's much more in line with Aaron Feltz's concern about humanism as a another. <laughs> and uh, nature is to be used similar to how things go, and what we should do. So if you're interested, go up and look at uh, Hawking's um, trip off in that direction also. And I, I rather like Hawking, so I was somewhat attracted to once finding that. And I, I liked the arrogance of humanism when it first came out. And it was somewhat important in my work on climate change. Um, then we sort of move on to uh, uh, Churchman. And uh, West, I, I like very much, he was, probably my favorite systems person, uh, particularly because he and Russ didn't get along all that well, e even though, of course, they did Russ's dissertation together, which not sure if you know this, but this was the first example at the University of Pennsylvania of the thesis advisor and the student writing the dissertation together. And they both put their name on it and <laughs> submitted it to the university. You can imagine how that would upset the powers to be at a university, but nonetheless, they did it. Uh, it's a book called Methods of Inquiry. It's actually worth finding. Uh, published in what? I think 1950, David, 1951, something like that. I'm not sure if you can even find it anymore, uh, but it's, it's a rather magnificent piece. Probably has more church minute than Akoff. Um, covers 2,500 years of Western philosophy and where the major insights came from in that 2,500 years and what was responsible. And in essence, Churchman and Aikoff decided that throughout the history of philosophy and science, it's been a battle between the empiricist and the rationalist. And they've fought like hell throughout that time. But every now and then the two get together and work together, or a scientist works using both perspectives. And that's when the great breakthroughs happen. And that's when the really neat stuff happens, but it's very brief and it soon goes back to the war again. And so that book is about that war between empiricist and rationalist and, and quite a good book. But anyway, last time I uh, was sitting with uh, churchmen talking about whatever, uh, we were sitting out in the lounge someplace and I told him I was having trouble with this term environment as he was using it and as many people were using it. And increasingly as people will talk about climate change as they move to their basement, uh, they're going to say nasty things about the environment. 
over and over. And so I have somewhat switched to the word context, which is something which Bateson adored. It was sort of Bateson's favorite term instead of environment. And also Eric Christ liked context very, very much. And so I have sort of moved on to context and I use it in order to replace the word environment as most system science people use it. And in this book that'll be coming out before too long, I explain uh, how and why I did that, as well as suitable quotes from Trist and Bateson and, and other people on why context to them is almost everything. That uh, Bateson argues there is no meaning without context. If you make a statement outside of context, it is meaningless, et cetera, et cetera. And he claims that most people do make statements outside of context, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea of context, I think, is very important for my beginning to understand systems and my work with them. And I reserve environment more for this domain of uh, uh, larger systems of order, which climate change certainly is having an impact on. Does that confuse things, David? Um, no, it helps actually. I, I've dropped the link um, in the in the chat for, and this was actually. So, so, so David and I have actually been meeting on and off since 1998, and I'm a slow learner sometimes, and so it takes me a while to figure out some of this stuff. Um, and so he always used the word context, and it's like, okay. And then, then what happened was that Rafael Ramirez was talking about the work of Eric Trist and talking about causal texture theory, and it's like, okay, I know there's this word con uh, texture. It's like, where does this all come from? And so it turns out if you go all the way back to the early research that Emory and Trist did in 1965, they're reaching all the way back into Pepper's work. And Pepper was, uh, let's see, I have to go all the way to the bottom here, 1934, I think. Yep. And so um, the, the idea and thinking about texture, and I don't know if I, like, I've, I've seen other words like in the soft world world, they sometimes talk about fabric. And it's like, what do these, what do these people mean? Um, but I, I came to understand that they actually mean weaving threads together or weaving lines together. Right. Um, and so um, the, this is one of the problems uh, then, this is really kind of deep systems theory stuff. And mm -hmm. I think this can probably end up being the ISSS paper I'm working on this year, mm -hmm. is that what, you know, what happens is that we typically get into a workshop and people go, oh, you know, first you define the system and define the system boundaries. And you know, how, what's the system boundary? And you go, well, this is the environment and stuff like that. And it's like, and uh, I actually am finding it more confusing than helpful mm -hmm. because when you draw a boundary, it's kind of like what an economist would do. And they say, oh, that's an externality. Mm -hmm. What's an externality to an economist? That's all the stuff inside economics that you can't manage. So, you know, politics is an externality. Well, you can't manage politics, so we don't do it. And so, wait a minute, you know, economists that don't pay attention to politics, it's like, should you really do that? Or, you know, name whatever your favorite uh, topic is. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of texture would be that you have to weave it in. So if you go back to the economist, it would be that, well, okay, there actually what used to be in the 1980s or 1970s at University of Toronto, they're focused a lot on political economy which is politics and economics together. And you go, okay, you know, that's, that's a weaving of a texture together. I think for most of the world, an externality is something like an economist. And that's probably all you need to know about externalities just now and sort of put them away there and you're fine. Uh, if you wanna go a little bit deeper into the Trist work, uh, certainly Kurt Lewin was very important in terms of context that Kurt Lewin was uh, sort of one of his godheads. And the, he said the one reason, Chris said that one reason he liked me is because I came from Iowa, which is where he had met Kurt Lewin. And he said, you can't be all bad if you came from Iowa. And then later he said, well, you're mostly bad, David, but at least you're not all bad. But if you go a little bit deeper yet, uh, if you happen to look in Kropotkin, you'll find for him context was very important. And when he talked about all these different species in terms of which ones get along and which ones don't, now he did not deny Darwin, although everyone says he did. 
but in fact, he supported much of Darwin, but he denied this idea of the battleground of nature and the idea that everything is fighting in order to be on top of everything else. And he thought that was simply crap. And he went through all these different species in Siberia and elsewhere. And David, he did mention the Norwegian rats as well. And in fact, in some of his writing, he uses the term rats to talk about those that do not cooperate with others to make the setting better. And so he says there are some of those in every species, including humans. And in some areas, the species emphasize the rats, that in fact, they destroy everything for their own purposes, as the Norwegian rats do. And so he goes at length to talk about the cooperation within a species for the larger gain, the larger sum. And if you ever read his book, you'll see he goes on and on, chapter after chapter, going through all these different species that tend to cooperate, work together, and they create a context which, uh, in essence, if it doesn't make the setting better, at least it preserves the setting. And so uh, you can't know this. None of you can know this. Forget I said it. But that was Eric Tris's greatest hero. And quite a number of the things that were founded in the Tavistock came out of Kropotkin thinking. He could just never admit that because anyone who mentions Kropotkin is off the list. Can't be at a university, can't be in a science project, can't be a human being, et cetera, et cetera. Which simply means they were pro-Lenin because Lenin was the great enemy of Kropotkin. And so those two would have joint debates in St. Petersburg. If you don't know, Kropotkin was part of the royal family, which he was strongly against, strongly opposed to. And so his idea was how to get rid of centralized government, centralized organizations like idiot royal families. So he could go back to the cluster, to the group, to the community. Nonetheless, he and Lenin would argue on and on and on about politics, whereas he would argue that revolutions are extremely important. And he was a anthropologist, biologist type. And he claimed in his sciences, it was everything to have a revolution. But the revolution must always be nonviolent. No drop of blood could ever be spilled in a revolution that was meaningful. Whereas Lenin argued, not only must a drop of blood be spilled, but there has to be gushes of blood, huge amounts of blood. Plus, it doesn't matter whose blood it is. People remember with blood. And of course, Putin comes from that tradition. It's very, very important to spill a lot of blood so people remember. Whereas Kropotkin was a simple little being that felt you could never have a violent act and have it end up meaningful. So if you look at context, it more or less goes back to that realm, comes through Eric Trist, the Tavistock Institute, and then Bateson liked it very much. Bateson was a huge fan of context and they all went easy on environment, except for that famous Emerian Trist uh, paper on uh, the four environmental types. I, I don't know if any of you know, it's probably one of the most famous papers within uh, system sciences, the 1965 on environmental typologies. There they use the word environment. And Tris told me the major reason he did is because he was on a flight from uh, New York to London and it was a propeller plane and at some point, the captain said, please put on your seat belts. We're approaching a turbulent environment. And so he said, based on that, he brought the word turbulent and environment into their article and wrote this masterful article that's probably the best thing you could read if you want to understand uh, climate change. It's a fantastic introduction to climate change. And just a quick footnote, he and Emery did not always get along and they had quite an argument in that article, which isn't in the article, where he argued for a type five environment after turbulent. He argued for a vortex environment, which to him was something like, well, then I did my research on climate change. That's where you go into an environment that is so irreversible, you're not gonna get out of it. 
Uh, and in a lot of my work, I call that sort of the human black hole, that you don't escape from that one. So context is terribly important for all those people. And since I like them, it's important for me. Does that help, David? Yeah. We've been doing a lot of talking, so let's get some uh, other voices in here. So uh, Zad dropped in a, uh, a question. Do you want to make a comment, Zad? Yeah, I was just, because um, David, uh, David Ng, that is, you've been kind of micro-blogging some excerpts from the chapter, uh, chapters of Arrogance and Humanism, and um, reading it, I'm just wondering, what was David Ehrenfeld writing? What was the context to play on that word? What was, his, what was his context? Why was he writing it? For whom was he writing? And what do we take away from it to today? To, uh, from today? Why is it relevant? Because uh, one other thing, when, when you read it, uh, it's very, it's, it's well critical, but it almost gets to like a somewhat spiritual level in the sense of how deeply um, contested he is against um, elements of controlled reality, you could say. So I find that part particularly interesting. If I'm reading it uh, accurately, I'm not sure. I think you are. It's, it, it does have religious overtones because in essence, he's criticizing other religions and then how the other religions were more or less forsaken or given up with industrialization. And then humans adopted science and technology as the new religion. And so these are the science and technology, uh, humans would exceed God and go beyond the God problem and God limitations. And so in essence, it was another kind of religion which had outdone or replaced the previous religion. And he is criticizing it because of that. But in essence, he's using many, shall we say religious metaphors in the process of criticizing the religion. And we all do that. Whatever we criticize, we end up being. So we have to be careful. It's, be was careful he, who you argue with. Was he working with a lot of the science community no. that brought this upon? Not so many. He was uh, sort of a, a missionary that stumbled into environmental pollution, environmental deterioration relative to a, his biology work. So he was quite concerned about where humans are going relative to nature. And so his concern was that humans were out of hand, particularly with technical development. And in essence, they were doing a job on nature. And plus they felt good about it. So at least he wanted them to feel guilty, not necessarily change them. So then David Hawk, that is, um... How do you square, is there a bit of irony then that a climate change advocacy or momentum or action borrows hardcore uh, like technocracy type of type of vibes? Like how do you, isn't that a funny uh, whirlwind of a situation? First you humble yourself to know that there's an environment out of control, but then you gain enough arrogance to try to say, I'm gonna change it. Yeah, I think the arrogance just now has more to do with how humans are going to stop the progression of climate change. And I, I some years ago, decided we were not, that mm -hmm. we're not capable of it. And I think that's somewhat consistent with Aaron Feld, but uh, back in 78, when we put this together initially, uh, he was not quite ready to give up on humans, that he somehow felt that they would see the light or they would develop technology that would allow them to deal with carbon issues. Mm -hmm. and so he was an optimist compared to me at least. So when I did my work in the seventies, I was pretty pessimistic, particularly against, shall we say lawyers and particularly against regulation and particularly against governments. Because in my work, I demonstrated how the government in essence was creating climate change. And uh, that, that was a, a tough research project, but involving six countries and 20 companies. And all I had to have is a company that had production facilities in many countries. And then we studied all those plants in detail to see the impact that regulation had. Did it make the plant dirty or clean? And in that study, we found out everything in the US was becoming dirtier. It had the toughest regulation in the world. And we were absolute pigs 
And so in our work, we made fun of the Americans, which the companies helped a great deal. And lo and behold, the wimpiest country was Sweden, and they were the most successful at controlling pollution. And so we use that as a basis to talk about a dead end we were heading down. Whereas he was more optimistic that humanism could be modified, changed. You could get, I think as David's pointed out, there's sort of a dual track in there that you know, we normally think of humanism as a plus. You know, at least we're humanistic about this as opposed to, well, you know, we're not that. <laughs> Where he was taking the issue and say, yes, that is there. But there's also this humanism as a religion which puts humans above everything, particularly nature. So nature is sort of, as the Bible says, something for you to use. And if you're bored, you can abuse it a little bit, not too much, but a little bit, and on and on and on. So he was on both streams. Does that answer? Yes, very helpful. Thank you. I didn't realize he's still alive. No, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, I he, thought he did pass away. He, he was alive not long ago, but I... I don't know. I check up on these people every now and then. Okay. Mostly I check up on lawyers I've hired to see if they're still alive. And my God, they live a long time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to criticize lawyers, but <laughs> as a slight tangent, uh, 10 years ago, I went back into court for many cases. I had five court cases beginning at the same time. And that was actually to retest my work on climate change in the 70s. Because in the 70s, we showed that the lawyers were a main problem, particularly American trained lawyers. Uh, in case you don't know it, in one of the first classes in law school, you're told, at least at the top ones, that there's a fundamental difference between ethics and the law. And so my advice is forget the ethics, it'll confuse you. Go for the law. And then later in the lecture, he points out the law can be whatever you want it to be, but you're allowed to interpret it many ways. So not only can you use the law to avoid ethics, you can be unethical with it. And so it's very hard to recover from that kind of lecture, that kind of textbook. And so that's why I'm pretty tough on them. And, and uh, I was pretty tough back in the 70s on them. So I did this thing David knows about of one of the universities firing me. So as opposed to taking a professor emeritus, a salary, a retirement package, I, I asked them to please bring criminal charges against me. And so they brought criminal charges against me and we were in court. And lo and behold, the lawyers were just like they were in the seventies. It was phenomenal. And that's not for this discussion, but the process I went through to find the worst possible lawyer was fantastic that I went through all kinds of court cases to find a really disgusting lawyer for my purposes. And disgusting was they used many sentences of 120 words. And by doing that, they have no idea what they're saying and then no idea how to get out of it once they've said it. And generally the sentence contradicts where they began. And then I would take you through a law as written, say the Water Quality Act, and it's written by those people. So I'd pull out sentence after sentence of our legislative acts to show my God. Anyway, the prime minister of Sweden came out and made a lecture to OECD on my work and said, ah, oh, you Americans, you just don't understand the first rule for obeying the law is understand it. Because obviously no one in the US can understand your laws and they're written that way. So that's a caveat that's actually very important because it gives you a context. Back to the context. Context is terribly important. There's no system without a context. Sorry, David, I talk too much. <laughs> it's okay. Cheryl was uh, helpful in, in finding a soft copy of uh, Methods of Inquiry. And I was <laughs> gonna invite her to uh, ask her question about Bateson. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's just a it's a straightforward question, but it's actually been superseded by a sort of different question. But I was just um, I wondered whether the Bateson reference that you're referring to, were you referring to steps to an ecology of mind? Is that you said it was quite an important read? 
Yeah, it, I, uh, I took it from an interview he was having uh-huh. with a college audience, but I believe it is someplace in that book also, at least his discussion of context. But his zinger, which I'm including in the preface to this new book of mine, so I, I'm including his comment verbatim on, uh, on context and the fundamental importance of context. So Bateson and many others of that type uh, found context terribly important and were quite open about it because they wanted to diminish the environment word and not have it used for so many things to confuse so many people in so many ways. I'm having trouble making out the word, whether you're saying contexts with an X or context. Ten, with an X, context. I guess there's an X in there. Yeah, <laughs> as Unless, opposed to not having an X. <laughs> I mostly misspell, so I'm not a good person to ask. <laughs> but context and, and the concept of context, just maybe give me a 101 on that. So it's you're, you, you're using it in, in to replace the word environment. Is that uh, correct? No, to sharpen the word environment. To sharpen it. Yeah. And how does it sharpen it? Uh, do any of you know of Andres Angle? In 41, he was one of the first to make a big deal of it. Uh, he defined it as opposed to environment is that which you interact with. But he was one of the early systems people. And so he in, defined the setting in terms of that which you have interaction with. Much in the environment you don't, but in context you do. So in your context, there's interaction, either it hollering at you, say a mother after a child, or uh, the child with the mother biting the mother, that there's an interaction which defines the context. Whereas the environment, people often end up saying everything. And so to avoid being everything, uh, Andrew Sangol would go into context and all these others. Kurt Lewin did too, Um, Bateson did, Triss did, but the Emory and Triss went beyond that to talk about contextual. And so for them, contextual was the added piece to context they found very important. It sounds like a term that, um, it sounds like an idea that maybe maybe something interesting, it's, it's time has come in terms of thinking about the metaverse and that we're, there's sort of a whole new concept of environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. For people sitting in the middle of a uh, th- thunderstorm, tornado, hurricane, the word context becomes meaningful. Mm-hmm. Environment, less so. Mm-hmm. And so we're entering a period where Uh, Contextually specific uh, is meaningful. And uh, you can begin to then find out what you might do or not do based on understanding, appreciating, knowing a context. Whereas environment, what the hell? You know, it's all of it. Certainly the moon's in it, but is Mars? How do we draw Mm. the line? So I was just going to ask you one more question, then I'll I'll make some room. But um, so y- you sounded quite negative. <laughs> is that your me? Is that your Thanks is that your me. mo? Save um, <laughs> Save me. Negative. And so oh. so you were sort of like you know climate change, forget it. So what what's the what's the alternative? Uh, be nice. <laughs> That's all I know now. Just be nice. Just be nice to each other. That uh, I think we're sort of going out of business. I, I see no no signs of us uh, managing what brings the irreversibility behind climate change is becoming more so. So they talk about one and a half degrees. Uh, we raise the temperature one and a half degrees Celsius. That's irreversible from then on. And now the scientists I uh, most like to deal with, say, we've passed one and a half. That, in, in essence, the most we can hope for is stopping at two. Mm-hmm. And then others say, no, we're headed for, for four. And uh, four is very interesting. There's v- very little forms of life left. 
and a four degree differential. Do you think that some the this concept of um, that we've introduced here, the arrogance of humanity, isn't there just sort of an arrogance to being human, like to think anyway that uh, there's perpetuity, that there's there's no like in terms of the arc of all things sure. yeah. that that there's kind of an inevitable inevitability to that, and that there's a sure. an arrogance to thinking that there isn't. Yeah, anyway, no, I mean, it's it's beyond our capacity to sort of function and carry that yeah. thought. But that's that's sort of mean, but very accurate. Mm. My daughters tell me I'm the most arrogant person they ever met, and so it's it really cripples me when I have to talk to my daughters because they don't respect me, they don't obey me, and that as I mentioned elsewhere, I have had four, six marriages with four women, and they were all wrong. And why don't people understand they were all wrong? It wasn't me, et cetera, et cetera. I don't so, know how we went from climate change you're, to you're, that, but. <laughs> well, it's all related. It's all related. <laughs> it's all related. Systems, right? <laughs> no, the, we have a seed of arrogance in all of us. Yes. And I think maybe it's an escape route more mm. than uh, anything else. We escape into arrogance when we can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been watching the, David to try and figure out if David does that. He just smiles all the time. He's very unhelpful. He, but maybe arrogance is sort of like hope. Maybe it's it's one of those things that just helps uh, yeah. helps no, think, humans to function. I think it's a doorway. Mm -hmm. It's just where it goes to. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's interesting. Arrogance is a doorway. Mm, it's good. Good concept. Anyway, I'll make some room. I've sort of mm -hmm. taken us in a sideways if i might be allowed uh, david to just kind of sort of give some color to some of the stuff that david hawk has uh, presented <laughs> today one might uh, as you've properly suggested cheryl you might think that um you might get a certain impression about him and you probably have not as much exposure as we've had i I consider his uh, thoughts obviously very truthful, but very amusing, and in some way he's self self deprecating, if I might suggest. He's he's done some things in the world that uh, would inspire us, but he doesn't talk too much about those things in a positive fashion. So you might be getting the wrong idea if I could be so bold to suggest that. Yeah, I, yeah, I should send you a copy of my resume. That. Uh, I got so tired of people offering to do resumes that are perfect. And so I was having trouble being, I had a lot of job offers. I keep getting job offers, mostly for my comments on LinkedIn. Anyway, I put together a resume of uh, about 30 pages because the experts say it should be two or three. And so I just multiplied by 10 and did a resume of 30 pages where the first page has a large heading, unemployable, underneath my picture. And then it goes into great depth on all the places I've been fired and the people that have fired me and why they fired me. And so now people thinking of hiring me, I send that resume to them. And the most recent was uh, Japan's largest steel company uh, wants to set up a factory and a special kind of company in America. And they sent me an offer to be the CEO of the company. And I thought that was pretty silly. So I sent back an emphasis on why I was fired. And they said, yeah, yeah, we know all that. We've actually talked to people that have fired you, but we know your history. And we would just like you to sign a contract saying you will be our CEO. And then we'll tell you how much we're gonna pay you. And we're gonna be like you about the salary. And so, so I'm, I'm certainly not going to take the job, but I'm really enjoying the exchange because of that resume. And it, it caught their attention and they want to cause trouble with it. And so there's somebody with humor in that Japanese company. Uh, another offer was from a company. They offered me $1,000 an hour, but I was not allowed to work more than 40 hours a week during the year. That there was a strict limit on my working. And so we had a discussion for a month about why they would keep me at 40 hours. That's just disgusting and on and on and on. But all of these things turn into complete humor. And I actually become friends with 
these uh, people in the process, but uh, that resume is sort of a zinger and uh, meant to, uh, well, you know what websites are like, right? You get offers all the time on how to improve your website. And I get those, okay. I always respond by saying, I used to have a website, davidhawk.com, where I got 30,000 visitors a month. And I just couldn't take it because it's rude, it's arrogant. I, I couldn't answer their emails. So I redesigned and now I get three a month. And so three messages a month is about right. And so I'm very happy with three, but they offered to raise my viewership. And so we started a discussion on what the hell they want to do. Why do they want to destroy my life with all these people looking at a stupid website? And so I, I meet a lot of interesting people with this attitude. It's, uh, yeah, it, so stop it, Dan. You're just causing trouble. Dan's a friend, by the way. I hope. If I may, uh, I just, I'd like to go back. Uh, all of that was very interesting. <laughs> and, uh, but <laughs> I'd like to go back. I'm really, I'm struck by this idea of arrogance as a doorway. And I, I think what I want to ask you is, is this concept of a doorway just something that I'm, I don't know about? Or did you just, was that just something that you said? Because I, I think that it's interesting, this idea of certain traits, human traits as being doorways to something else. Oh boy, it's, um, you know, so, as, yes. as, as with systems approaches, there's sort of an important language that you need to develop relative to what you're working on to help yourself because you're really the person that you're trying to help. Mm -hmm. When I write books, I'm trying to explain to myself, not anybody else. I, I, it's too arrogant to think you're gonna to explain to somebody else. So these books are all written to me to try and understand. But relative to, uh, to all of that, uh, the doorway, uh, at some point, David and I are gonna have a discussion about dimensions, which I have mm -hmm. mentioned before, but I have, six dimensions I talk a lot about in this last book and mostly having to do with uh, politicians and other sorts of people like that are down in dimension zero and one. And I explained in some detail why they're in zero and one and why all arguments more or less are in one dimensional. You know, it's a line with two ends and there's a different person on each end arguing about nothing, but in essence, willing to kill each other for some strange reason because of that line and who's right and who's wrong. And so that's the first dimension. Uh, the second dimension is very nicely described in Flatland, a, a book I would introduce all of you to. It's life in a two-dimensional existence. A three-dimensional world is more or less nature, the world of nature. And that's why I use the term mother nature to talk about the three-dimensional reality. And the fourth dimension is the dimension of time. And I often use the word father time simply because that's the home of entropy and that's the destructive dimension. And so he, uh, men are very good at destroying things. So I put men in charge of the fourth dimension. And then we have a fifth dimension, which is to answer your question. And I'm increasingly talking about the fifth dimension. Perhaps it's a religion, I don't know. But I think in the fifth dimension, all forms of life understand each other and all humans communicate to each other. And one of the reasons we're so pissed off is because we understand what each other means. And so in the fifth dimension, we know what everyone's thinking and we know what everyone means. And the trees know what we mean. We know what a tree means. So in the fifth dimension, <laughs> it's all known. And that's why these decades, humans are so pissed off because they know what each other's thinking. And, and so that sort of addresses your question, which is an extremely good question. But that's, shall we say, my cop out. So I, I sort of duck and hide and go off to the fifth dimension and say, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, going to suggest actually a, a slightly different direction um, if, if we back up, because to, to me, the question of arrogance uh, then comes out to a question, well, if someone makes an assertion, 
um, how is it they know it's so? Um, and qu quite often it's pure arrogance in the sense of they really don't know what they're talking about. Um, but if they're not actually purposefully going that direction, then it becomes like an epistemological question, which is, you know, can you know, should you know, um, and um, are there other ways of knowing? And, and so That's good. Uh, I, I'm going to re redirect a little bit. I, I, I sent a message. I'm going to redirect into the non-rational because um, one of the things that uh, this was an, an early, an early um, encounter with David Hawk, which was in uh, 2003, um, is that uh, uh, the original story was that uh, uh, in 1999, uh, we started meeting um, uh, and uh, it was, uh, we'd have meeting. I was, I was flying to New York uh, and we'd have meetings with Ian Simmons, who was at IBM Research, and Mina Takala, who was uh, David's student, who came from Finland. And so, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001, we're meeting regularly and having discussions, kind of like we're having right now. Um, and, uh, and so uh, Mina uh, finished her graduate work at NJIT and moved back to Finland. And so in uh, 2003, uh, David in January was going, going to Finland, and it's like, uh, and so he's going to teach a class. And I said, oh, you know, can I come help? And he said, sure. And I said, okay. So we made arrangements and I went to Finland. Now, the question you could ask is, what was I doing in Finland? And the answer that I, that I can give, which is the rational answer, is that, well, you know, Mina and David and I had had all these great discussions, so I'd like to see Mina again. But when you boil right down to it, it's kind of like, what's the right answer? The right answer would be, I felt like it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was, uh, you know, going some job stress, you know, a little frustration here and there and stuff like that. Just like, I just felt like going. So, mm -hmm. but saying that you feel like going to Finland and teaching a class, like, is that rational? So, okay. So what's actually going on here? And so that's, that's yeah. part of when I started looking into the non-rational because it's not wrong. It's a choice that I made in my life and, ended up in the PhD program in Finland that I'm still trying to complete. Um, but uh, it's, you know, what, what is all that about? Because it's not rational to be doing these sorts of things. So if it's not rational, then how do you explain human behavior for someone who's seemingly rational? I mean, for the rest of you, that's an extremely important point that David's making. Uh, maybe I could best explain it in my terms of why was I in Finland? And I was in Finland for what I'd like to think was rational or non-rational. Uh, I had been in Sweden for 20 some years, uh, founded an institute there, which went very well until my co-founder died. So when he died, the Stockholm School of Economics took it over in part because it had a hundred million dollars behind it. And the larger school wanted that money desperately. They won it for 20 years. But finally, when he died, they uh, fired me in a formal process. So I was fired in Sweden and the Finns heard about it. So the Finns sent me a letter asking me if I could please come and work in their university. That they said the only qualification they liked was the fact I'd been fired in Sweden. And anyone fired in Sweden, they would love to have working in Finland. So is that rational or non-rational? Or is it irrational? And it's the same relative to David ending up there, which was sort of, part of the same situation. Uh, I consider it in Churchman's terms, non-rational, not really irrational, although there was angst and anger and whatever involved in some of it. But I think the idea of the non-rational is quite a lovely term. I, I like very much. And that's why I'd say David ended up in Finland. Much more power than rational. So um, I'm going to invite Zad to actually prompt other people in the SFI program, because uh, I think there's some questions now about rationality, arrogance, and maybe design. Uh, Zad? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a bridge here in case, like, I don't know. I know Michael's done some work on, on, on the question of should we, which came up. Um, I know Roxy has a lot of different service design kind of practices and she engages with different clients and helps them kind of equip them with different perspectives. I don't know, I'm just curious to hear what SFI grads think about the connection point between design and 
um, even non-rational as you're talking about, David? Sure. Anyone, Nelia, Griff, anyone, Cheryl? I'm going to jump in, so I'll give you a moment to think about it, because I, I certainly want to challenge um, messing up my April. Um, and I, I, as far as why do I do certain things, Don Officer is a former coach of mine as well, and I, and I <laughs> certainly have gone down this strange pathway. Um, but part of my April was making commitments and I, I'd like to think that I cared. And that care word is something that relates to quality. Uh, and ho hopefully part of that pathway that is going to take us forward. It, it completely messed up my April by taking on um, a, a submission to a, a social innovation international conference and taking us down social, um, let's see, systems changes learning on modern slavery. It was not an easy topic to slam through on a 10 day uh, deadline. But I, but I, I, I kind of want to offer up care. And if not me, then who? That would be the arrogant part. Hmm. Yeah, it's. I'm afraid I'd file you under the feminine now because men don't care. I've never met a man that cared. So yeah. now you're off on the feminine. I'm kidding. That's a joke, right? <laughs> Guys, you care, right? Are you still there? Does anybody care? I, I think she's onto something very important. And, and we sort of don't relate to it because uh, it's very important if you're a great scientist and a great intellectual to not care. Mm. If you care, that means your values are screwing up everything you're supposed to be looking for that's called the truth. And so caring colors things. And wow, why would you want to color things? So is that an enemy? Care? At least for men it is. Have you, I mean, look at our leader from the past, Donald Trump, did he care? <laughs> Too much. <laughs> And Putin, does he care? <laughs> and I'm afraid President Xi and China is falling into the same leadership group. Hmm. It's important to not care if you're going to be a leader. Hmm. That's sick, isn't it? Let Kelly? Me, let me re-invite uh, Nelia or Michael or Roxy to speak. Uh -huh. Um, well, my, I only had a, a few thoughts I, about your, um, why did you go to Finland? And it was a non-rational or a rational thing. I, I guess I take a little bit, I, I, maybe I don't understand it uh, completely, but I, I don't know. I often feel emotions are rational, that maybe we don't understand them completely, but they are, you know, there's something that that impetus like I just want to go like that I, I have a desire that's a like that it that uh even though we can't explain them in rational way mm -hmm. that there is often as you mentioned before other ways of knowing um, <laughs> I I don't know if I'm using that term in the right way but I know it has like a specific um and then um and then about arrogance well, you know, there's two, there's two, you know, there's, there's positive and negative aspects to things like arrogance, right? You need a little bit of arrogance to, to, you, to believe in yourself, to get it, to push an idea forward, to bring it into the world, right? You need, you need a little bit of that hubris um, to get anything done. But um, I guess, I guess I wrestle with like, well, when, the, the arrogance of humans to think that you can get everything done is also, I, I don't know. Just Not sure if you, there was a recent court case with a Harvard graduate woman who was considered one of the best business women in the US. I won't mention her name, but that was brought up in her testimony uh, where they were asking her about this model that she had used, fake it till you make it. And that was the definition of arrogance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. 
One question that was brought up is how does being non-rational and arrogance relate to design? And I think <laughs> people are non-rational by nature and to design as if they are rational mm -hmm. is arrogant for us to assume that we know how one will perceive the product experience, what have you, that we design mm -hmm. is arrogant. Mm -hmm. Good. I like that. Um, you could also say it's, it's humble because you recognize that you really don't know why you're doing it. Yep. So it's a mixture of both. Now, one of the things that interests me here is I, I didn't think it would, but I'm, I'm reviewing this book right now. I kind of wonder if you can read that. Emotions Don't Think <laughs> by a, a retired psychotherapist I happen to know. And he makes a very, uh, very compelling case to uh, the riskiness of making decisions on an emotional basis, especially if the emotions didn't originate with you and you have been infected. You've experienced a, if I can use that word so loosely, a contagion, right? A pandemic of some strong feelings, which seems to happen from time to time. But it can also happen on a very small scale. And it can happen uh, to change your whole character by continually pushing the same buttons. And uh, I don't know, I, as long as we separate emotions from thinking, which we seem inclined to do, um, I don't think we'll ever come up with a, an answer to this, though maybe we won't if we pull them back together again either. <laughs> Who knows? This, yeah. No, I, I think it was Churchman that made the distinction between rational, non-rational, and irrational. Mm -hmm. And so, and then when I was discussing that with him, I was talking about public hearings I would attend oh, as yeah. an example for him to explain that you have the board that supervises the room with policemen along the side, of course, to keep order. Mm. And so it's a town meeting about a building is going to be changed and so people are allowed to get up and make a point and so you know the little old lady that's always talked about got up and made a point about what she was going to do if you destroy that building oh <laughs> and, and the chairman of the board says hold on hold on let's keep this civilized that you're going to have to be rational in this meeting otherwise i'm going to have you uh evicted mm. and then she goes bananas <laughs> and then she's evicted from the room. So in essence, the argument was, and the one that Wes and I were talking about was, uh, you know, people claim they want to be rational, whereas 90% of them is non-rational. And so if you try to package some of the important non-rational as rational, you end up with the irrational. So in essence, that man created the irrational in that lady by what he did. Mm -hmm. And so in order to be a good leader, say of a meeting or whatever, you just don't go there. Yeah. You deal with the non-rational and assume it's extremely important. Yeah. And you don't just say, please be rational about this. Mm -hmm. Or the same in a kitchen in the morning with a spouse. Never say, please be rational about this. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's when the screaming starts. And so Ch yeah. Churchman was very good about those three categories. And yeah. where the irrational comes from. Yeah. I'm not sure about a rational. That sounds too nice. I sort of like it. <laughs> I hate to see it ruined. <laughs> it does sound good. Yeah. Michael, did you have some words on design for us? <laughs> um I don't know if I have words on design. I just sort of thinking about this, this rational idea and um, like to me, you, you can think of rational uh, or like as a, as a process or something going on in your head, but it can also be like the rationale for something. Mm -hmm. And in other words, it's, you're trying to justify it. Um, and I guess, depending upon how open you are, um, that justification may be arrogant, um, or it may be, um, humble. You may be showing mm -hmm. humility, uh, in the face of what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think whether it's irrational or rational it may it may come down to how well 
you think you can justify mm -hmm. what you're doing. Nice. Uh, and that may nice. flow into the design process where you're trying to create something um, and you may be trying to justify it or not. That's that's very nice. I like that. It helps. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I've never argued for a systems approach because for me, it's so obvious. I mean, why wouldn't you mm -hmm. do that? Mm -hmm. So why in the world would I argue for it? What's the alternative? That seems arrogant, right? Mm -hmm. That's a problem. That's a problem. David taught me that, by the way. <laughs> so the, the two people who haven't spoken yet are Griff and Doug. So would you like to make some comments? You're on mute, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm struck in in the uh, conversation about by one of the few things uh, uh, from social psychology, Aronson uh, right. said, we're not rational animals, we're rationalizing animals. <laughs> yeah. so, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, uh, it takes us back to another session, David, the one on entropy. Oh, yeah. That's the least <laughs> rational thing. Yes, yes. That's right. Don't ever include entropy in a discussion. It no. should not be rational. <laughs> well, speaking to what, what Doug just said, um, uh, I, I believe neuroscientists have now pretty much indicated, I, I guess by using a super, super powerful stopwatch, that um, you often think you've made a decision when, and your body's actually moving to do it before you uh, you you actually believe you've made it and this happens again and again all the time and if it didn't happen quite often you'd be in a real pickle um of course sometimes that gets you into a pickle because <laughs> something up there uh, knows knows what you really want to say and before you have a chance to censor it but uh, uh on the other hand uh, it, it probably saves your life you know but it, it, there's there's a lot of problems like that. Uh, I mean, the whole issue of memory has become really, really extremely problematic. And uh, as we begin to understand how the the neural networks work, or don't work, or mm -hmm. deteriorate, or get confused, or rebuild uh, an impression of something that never happened, and that happens a lot for everybody all the time. Something to think about. If you can remember it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. If the truth is important to you, then that's a problem. Yeah. You can always switch and become one of those that truth is irrelevant. Then yes. the memory also. Yes, yes. Well, we, you were talking about the Russians. What was it? Uh, um, nothing is certain, so everything is possible. That's one of their favorite phrases. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, pass, pretty. Pass the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If you really want to deal with the technological optimist, they should go read the book. I guess it's Genius is the title. Isn't that David? Uh, I think it's called Genius. Uh, anyway, he was the co-designer of the uh, hydrogen bomb. And he before he did that, he felt that through technology, humans can solve all problems. And so in essence, if we can design the hydrogen bomb, there'll be no more warfare again. Mm. And then some years later, when he and I put on some conferences together, his theme was uh, they will be used for warfare. The humans are not smart enough to avoid it. And mm -hmm. that, so I would argue that climate change will get us. He said, no, 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 it's gonna be a nuke. And so, we would have these conferences where we would argue which is going to get humans first. Jeez. And he would argue, depends on how stupid they are or how productive they are. If they read The Economist, then they'll use nukes because right. it's much more productive to use nukes to get rid of people. And anyway, but that book is quite good for those that are technological optimists. Mm. Uh, you know, the, what's the title? The Genius You Never Knew or something. Mm. Uh, 
It's a very good book. Very good guy. He's he's given up. Oh dear. Nelia has her hand raised. Oh yeah, I um I wanted to go back. You you gave an example in your talk about how um, the U.S. regulations they had the, the the strongest regulations and they were the worst polluters, and you compared it uh, to a, a other country. I, I just wanted to to ask why you thought that was only because of the research project that shocked all of us. That based on that, OECD passed a resolution saying that uh, uh, OECD should not support any regulation coming out of the United States of America. Mm. They were quite firm on it. There's only one dissenter, which was the US. Mm -hmm. And then the head of EPA wrote me a personal letter that was a very hateful letter, I think. Really mean-spirited. But uh, let's see, she had all copies of my report collected throughout EPA put them in a box, sent them to Iowa and said, dear <laughs> Mr. Hawk, we have no further use of these reports, nor you. And I will make sure you never are allowed to do research that we cooperate with in your life and on and on. And so she dissented against OECD's vote, it seems. But the U.S. was, I, don't know, I, I blame the, the law schools, not the students. And uh, I used too many jokes in my research. I shouldn't have. That was unfounded. I, it should have been more serious. But I could. I, I interviewed a number of U.S. senators that had written the laws, and they verified my thesis that they didn't know what the hell they were doing. And Muskie's comment was, "We wrote a law relative to the Water Quality Act, and we'll wait two years and drag it back in and fix it." We know it's broken, we just don't know how and why. Mm. And so that's how the laws are passed in the US from the mentality of the lawyers that we elect as politicians. Yeah. Some of them have a sense of humor, some don't. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty grim. And, and all you had to do is, let's see, the US Water Quality Act was 10,000 pages, just it. <laughs> and all of Swedish regulation in all areas of environment was 25 pages back then. And so the prime minister held up the 25 page document versus documents he couldn't lift to show the difference. And again, made the comment that in Sweden, we have a funny idea that to obey the law, you should understand it. But of course, Americans don't have that. And I demonstrated the lawyers didn't understand it either. It was all sort of camouflage. Anyway, it gets worse than that. You don't want to go there. <laughs> so I'm, my uh, what I understood is that the quality, the the laws themselves were not effective, and they were poorly written, and they were not uh, enforced properly. Is that yeah, there were two laws that I emphasized. One was in New Jersey in '75. They passed a law saying toxic waste is not allowed in New Jersey. There could be no toxic waste in New Jersey. Hmm. Thus, Texaco didn't need to worry about its toxic waste from its plant. So they farmed it out. Uh, maybe some of you heard this, sorry, David. But they farmed it out to a small trucking company to take care of the toxic waste at night. And so they'd come in and I hung around at night to interview them as they were filling up the toxic waste. And they said, and I said, where are you taking it? Does that matter? And they said, oh, we're going to redistribute it. And you might use the word recycle it. We go out to the New Jersey, New Jersey Turnpike, turn the spigot on a little bit and drive up and down the turnpike all night. And so we're simply giving it back to the consumers to recycle. Well, a year later, finally, New Jersey took away that law. Another law was in 33, Congress passed a law saying that you're not allowed to patent entropy. I'm sorry, you're not allowed to patent neg entropy. When you discover or develop something that's neg entropy, you cannot have a patent on it. That's firm. So that's what I think of. Okay. It's pretty bad out there. And my three volumes of research was filled with those examples. Sorry. <laughs> Don't commit suicide now. Wait, wait. Much well longer. 
Hmm. I think we're gonna have one last question. Dan had asked a question. Did you want to bring that up? Okay, I'll try doing this. It's uh, something I'm struggling with actually. So I'm posing the question, how does the understanding of brain function help us understand the relationship between irrational, irrational, and rational? Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't try it. <laughs> I, I would delegate that to the mind. I would keep that distinction between the mind and the brain and let the biology do whatever it does. Yes, yes. And then send it off to the mind. And then once it's in the mind, the fifth dimension will accept it. And so it can all go there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's, a very, it's a very good question. I just haven't a clue. No, no. I think you said to me one time, the fifth dimension is not understandable. That's why you, you're afraid of it. I think that's the word yeah. you used one time. Yeah, it's, it's scary out there. Uh -huh. But at least it hopefully is there. Otherwise, nothing makes any sense. Uh -huh. I was just trying to figure out why people are so angry at each other. <laughs> I'm assuming it's because they understand each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're drawing to a close. Um, I think we're making progress over the entropy discussion because I asked a question last time where <laughs> people were more confused or less confused at the end, but I think maybe we actually are less confused than when we started this discussion, so that's uh, something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have been catching up on uh, on recordings, um, and they're in the blog, so either on coalevolving.com or at wiki dot ston dot org. Um, okay. we're, we're almost up to date. I'm getting there. I'm very, very close to being up to date on uh, recordings. If people want to look back and uh, if they miss some sessions, they want to get there. Yeah. Um, the uh, last thing is uh, next month's um, session um, is, will be led by Zad Khan. Uh, and um, this will be interesting because um, I usually have the problem of explaining the system changes learning stuff. And so Zad is now going to get the double challenge of explaining system changes learning to designers or for designers or about design. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, Zad, do you have any <laughs> parting shots on that? <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> David Ng and company have assembled a robust body of work that relooks at change fundamentally, systems change is learning. Uh, and so the prompt for me is, A, how might you, how might I translate that um, into a more, not public, but, but for, for a multi-purpose audience into, from a design perspective, because that's the background I come from and a lot of my cohort fellows are here, uh, what horizons the systems change is learning afford for design? What does it mean for design or from a design perspective? Ah, there we go. I found it. I stumbled into it. Systems changes learning from a design perspective. That's about it. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> so I'll see everyone next month. Thanks. <laughs>